software is being a little funny. Okay, so just to give everyone an overview of our training this afternoon, what we want to do is really shine a spotlight on some new um, provisions in the Every Student Succeeds Act. You know, the Every Student Succeeds Act, I think hopefully everybody knows right now, major legislation made many changes for um, elementary and secondary education, including to the provisions for homeless students. Um, this is legislation that um, went into effect, the homeless provisions went into effect on October 1st. And there's so much within the reauthorization that we wanted to be able to really shine a spotlight on some of the provisions that maybe didn't get the highlights um, in the initial uh, information about the legislation. But um, we're getting a lot of questions in particular on the new authority under ESSA for liaisons to affirm HUD homeless status. So we wanted to provide an overview for you today. So what we'll do is we'll review those provisions. We'll look at the new uh, required training of liaisons by state coordinators, including on homeless definitions. We'll review the legal language and the, and the guidance uh, from the Department of Education about the new liaison authority to affirm HUD homeless status. Then we'll take a look at those two definitions. We'll look at the education definition of homelessness We'll look at the HUD definition of homelessness, um, and we will also then, you know, sometimes, so this is about eligibility for programs, but it's really important to think, what does this actually mean? What are our, um, children and youth actually eligible for? So we'll take a look at HUD homeless assistance, assistance programs, and then provide some general considerations on eligibility and documentation. Um, I want to say right at the outset that with any new policy, there are going to be questions that come up. Some of them we may not be able to answer today. Some of them we may need to turn to our partners at the Department of Education or HUD for answers, but we'll do our very best. And on that, um, we've muted everybody for the sake of kind of sound quality, but you can at any time in the presentation type your questions into the chat box. Please uh, make sure to um, chat, you know, to all so that we see it. And then um, I am joined today by the lovely and talented Patricia Julianelle our Director of State Projects and Legal Affairs, who will be um, moderating that chat box um, and we'll uh, turn to those questions at the end. Whatever questions we don't get to, we'll, re we'll um, be happy to take afterwards. And again, as I mentioned, I want to state you know, at the outset that with any new policy, um, we'll do our best, but the, it's, 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 an it's an evolution. So without, without further ado, let's take a look at those provisions. So the next two, couple slides look at the new requirements in ESSA. The blue language is current law and the red or maroon or orange color, depending on your, um, your Crayola box, uh, those reddish letters are things that are new within ESSA. So there's a new requirement at the state level for the state coordinators for McKinney-Vento to develop and implement professional development programs for liaisons and other LEA. For those of you who are not school people, LEA means local educational agency. Sometimes as a school district, sometimes it's another educational entity. And the purpose of the professional development is to improve the identification of McKinney-Vento children and youth and heighten the awareness of and capacity to respond to the specific needs to those children's and youth education. Many states have been providing technical assistance um, they, under the previous statute, but now there's a, a clear and new requirement to develop and implement professional development specifically for this purpose. And also new is that this training must include information on certain specified federal definitions of homelessness. So this is now, again, the requirement at the state level. If we look for school district liaisons, what's new with ESSA, liaisons are now required to participate in professional development and technical assistance as deemed appropriate by the state coordinator. So we have matching mandates, if you will. States have to provide, liaisons have to participate. And the focus of today's webinar, local liaisons who receive training provided by the state coordinator on federal definitions of homelessness are authorized to affirm that students meet the HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD definition of homelessness to qualify them for HUD home assistance programs. So that is directly from the statute. You see the citations there if you want to copy and paste so that you have actual uh, chapter and verse to provide to your districts and to your HUD partners. Looking at the um, Education Department, Department of Education's guidance on 
these provisions, we've included verbatim two questions. Again, Department of Education's guidance came out at the end of July, and what guidance is, is it is the department's interpretation of the statute uh, intended to help school districts and communities implement this legislation. So directly from the Ed guidance, question L4, can an LEA determine whether a child or a youth is homeless according to HUD's definition of homelessness? And you see the department's answer there, yes, uh, a liaison who receives this training may affirm without further agency action by HUD um, that a child or youth who is eligible for and participating, I won't go ahead and I won't read the entire slide to you there. You all can read for yourself, but this is a specific guidance from the Department of Education, um, one of the questions that's provided on this provision. More from the guidance, uh, the department states that local liaisons may make this affirmation, affirmation excuse me, in the form of a signed letter on district letterhead, letterhead that at a minimum identifies the most recent primary nighttime residence of the homeless, homeless child, youth, or family that was verified by the local liaison and to determine to whom to send um, this letter, liaison should contact the collaborative applicant for the continuum of care. So this is the department's guidance on how that affirmation would take place and also the direction to determine who to send it to, to, to send it to the collaborative applicant at the continuum of care. And you have a link there on the HUD Exchange website for the list of applicant, collaborative applicants and so you can find for your community who that would actually be. Now we know um, that many of you uh, may be new to the world of HUD homeless assistance. I also know that many of you are um, are seasoned veterans and um, you know or know this very well. But just as a primer for those of you who are new and you're saying, "Well, that's nice. What is a continuum of care?" Um, a continuum of care is a regional planning body. It's the body that coordinates housing and services funds for homeless families and homeless individuals. Um, sometimes this would be the task force, interagency task force. They they have different names, um, but this is the entity that would, that is submitting the application to HUD for funding. Um, this is the entity that's developing the long-term strategic plan and conducting year-round planning efforts. And it's also the entity that's managing HUD's required biannual point-in-time count of people who meet HUD's definition of homelessness. So for those of you who are new liaisons or those of you who are state coordinators and are going to be providing training similar to this, I think it's really important context to start with definition of terms um, as many of this will be new. And we do want to uh, improve coordination and collaboration between school district McKinney Vento liaisons and their HUD continuums of care, continue of care. So now we're going to take a look at these definitions. What you have here is, as says on the slide, a super short, super simple <laughs> version. So we're going to get into the details, but just to kind of put a, a overall framework on it, um, you have here um, a simplified, greatly simplified version, um, living situation in the left-hand column. You have the education definition, um, the, cat the situations that meet the education definition. Um, also, we added, it's important to note that Head Start programs, uh, child care programs uh, funded through the Child Care and Development Fund, um, and also USDA school meals. These programs also use the same definition. And for education, we're talking preschool education, K-12, higher education, special education. This is the statutory definition. So you can see which categories are covered there and then which are covered um, in the HUD definition. And I am going to um, see if I can make this go away. I can see my slide a little bit better. So you have Again, very simplified. The top two um, situations are covered by both unsheltered, emergency shelters, transitional housing, no question there. And then we get into the area where there's some conditions. So for hotels and motels covered in the education, if it is due to lack of adequate alternative accommodations, and then um, in the HUD context, um, if paid for by government or charity, and, and if it's paying, if people are paying for hotels or motels with their income, then only under very limited conditions, and we'll get into that in a moment. So that's the landscape, if you will, of eligibility around hotels and motels. 
um, with respect to people who are staying with others temporarily, um, sometimes called doubled up, but we are really moving away from that term. Um, it's a term that it means different things to different people. So, you know, looking to the education definition and the way it's written up in the law, staying with others if due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason. And then in the HUD homeless world, staying with others uh, only under very narrow conditions. And we'll look at that too. The term at risk of homelessness, there is not such a term at all in the education definition uh, and neither in the other federal programs that use the education definition. In uh, HUD lingo, at risk of homelessness is defined and it does include all families and youth who are homeless under other federal definitions. Um, so this is again very simple but just to give you a basic framework to begin to understand the nuances and the difference in these definitions. Uh, looking now, we're going to dig into these definitions a little bit more, and again, I'm going over this because I realize we do have people from the housing world on the webinar, we have people from the education world, so that everybody's kind of understanding and hearing about both definitions, and we're not making any assumptions that you're more familiar with one or the other. So the education definition, children and youth who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, and you have the statutory citation there. This very specifically in the law spells out some of the most common uh, living situations for homeless families and youth. Sharing the housing of others due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason. Again, it's not everybody who's staying with everybody. Um, it needs to be due to those factors. That's 75% of the students identified from McKinney-Vento in the 2013-2014 school year. So it's the majority of students identified as homeless um, by public schools. And then the next category in the statute, living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, or camping grounds due to lack of adequate alternative accommodations. That last part is the pivotal phrase there. Um, if you are on vacation and you're staying at the, you know, the, the Hyatt or the Radisson, um, you know, you have adequate alternative accommodations. You wouldn't be considered. Um, and the same thing with the other provisions that are, or the other categories are there due to lack of adequate alternative accommodations. Uh, for motels in the, covered in this category, that was 6% of students identified as McKinney-Vento by schools in the 2013-2014 school year. Um, this is one of the categories of the education definition that has seen the most growth over the past three or four years. Looking at the continuation of the definition, um, children who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate other situations covered there, emergency or transitional, house, house, uh, transitional housing, 15% of identified students, um, public or private places, uh, par car, car parks, et cetera, the other categories. We've added in that third bullet some um, language from the Department of Education's guidance. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot in McKinney-Vento was, well, what do you mean by substandard housing and how, do, how would that possibly qualify a student for McKinney-Vento? And the Department of Education gave very helpful guidance um, this year. So looking at um, utilities, uh, infestations, mold, dangerous situations, things that a school district would look at to make that determination that, it's a, that, that the housing is so substandard that it would qualify as homeless under McKinney-Vento. And again, we get a lot of questions about this. Um, I distinctly remember when I first started doing McKinney-Vento work um, a long time ago, and I was at a training in Alabama with school personnel, and one of the school social workers said she had a, a child who um, there was holes that were big enough in the roof of the, the kind of the shack where the family was staying, and the child said, well, I had to move my bed three times last night because I kept getting wet, you know, so it's an example of substandard housing, you might as well be in a tent, might as well be outside in situations like that. But I really would refer people to look at the guidance for additional pieces there. And then awaiting foster care placement has been part of the McKinney-Vento definition. That um, as I, as, is going away on December 10th. This is not really the, it's outside of the purview of this webinar, um, but um, that um, children awaiting foster care placement is defined differently in different states. Um, that will go away on December 10th, 2016 for all but three states and protections and educational protections for all children in foster care will go in place under Title I. So um, again, that may have very little relevance depending on your community, but it, we wanted to make sure to point that out. 
In terms of how you determine eligibility under the education definition, uh, we have very good guidance uh, from both the Department of Education and the Department of Education's uh, Technical Assistance Center, the National Center for Homeless Education. Eligibility determinations for schools under this definition is case by case, uh, very much individualized determinations. School personnel are directed to get as much information as possible with sensitivity and discretion, understanding that families and youth are often afraid and ashamed, um, embarrassed about their living situations. It's very important to look at the overall McKinney-Vento definition first, the specific the, the specific situations and then the overall definition, and some specific considerations for determining whether families or youth who are in the um, staying with others category, whether they qualify, um, questions that can be helpful, where would you go if you couldn't stay here, what led you to move into this situation. So if somebody says, well, um, you know, if I couldn't stay here, I'd be, you know, renting an apartment in the next community, um, not going to meet the definition of homelessness, most likely. If they say, I have no idea, I'd be staying in my car, I'd be on someone else's, else's couch, more likely to meet the McKinney-Vento definition. So just some broad considerations there. Um, the National Center for Homeless Education has an excellent brief on determining eligibility. You have the link there. So those of you who are new or want to look more into how you could, what kinds of questions you could ask sensitively to get that information, um, would refer you to uh, their good fact sheet there. And the context for the definition, and we're providing this again for those who are new, you know, why would uh, the education have a department and other federal programs for homeless families and children have a definition like this? Uh, the reality is that we don't have shelters for families or youth in many suburban and rural areas, and where they do um, exist, they're often, they're often full. Uh, Patricia and I, when we do trainings specifically around youth issues or, or even families, we say raise your hand if you have a shelter in your community. Um, there's never more than 15% of the people in the room that raise their hand. So um, shelters are really the tip of the iceberg and they may not exist. We also know that eligibility conditions of shelters sometimes exclude families. This is not supposed to happen for HUD funded programs. It's prohibited, but there are lots of private shelters who may impose additional conditions that make uh, families or unaccompanied minors face very tough situations and serve as a barrier to getting into those shelters. Certainly we know our unaccompanied youth, our youth on their own, are very afraid of adult shelters. Um, they may not seek shelter there because of their fears. There may be time limits. A family may have maxed out, for example. There may not be a motel or maybe it's too expensive or unsafe. And sometimes people just don't know what's available. They flee in crisis and they land where they land. So just a little bit of context for our education definition. And I'm also included in this an infographic. This comes from a report that was issued in June. Um, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you look at this report. Hidden in Plain Sight, a uh, report on homeless students, um, really groundbreaking report that was done by Civic Enterprises, released by Grad Nation. Um, interviewed homeless liaison state coordinators, but also interviewed youth who had been homeless uh, in middle school and high school. Uh, and, and you can see on the infographic, 78% of the youth that they surveyed said they experienced homelessness more than once. Um, they may be in different situations. So our education numbers, they really reflect where students were staying when they were first identified, and that may change many times throughout the year. Um, and this report uh, affirmed that, 78%. 47% so they were homeless both with their family, uh, with a guardian, and alone. We you know, often talk about youth and families as if they were two distinct populations and kind of have this siloed approach on family and youth homelessness. But the reality for young people, um, as evidenced by this report and certainly as evidenced in our own experience, for example, with our scholarship programs, is it's, it's fluid. Um, and so many young people start out homeless with their families, end up by themselves, and vice versa. 94% stayed with pe other people um, uh, rather than in one consistent place. So it's very, very common. This is what homelessness looks like for children and youth in our nation today. Now we're going to switch gears and look at the HUD definition of homelessness. Um, well, HUD has taken um, a complex definition and in its materials and TA um, collapse them into four categories. So I'm going to present them to you um, exactly as, as HUD would um, in the category. So HUD's definition of homelessness starts out with category one, which is, uh, again, you have the broad, same broad 
part of the umbrella definition, lacking fixed rate and adequate nighttime residence, and then spells out what it means. I'm not, again, going to read this entire slide to you, but simply call out the part that I've underlined here, which is this is where you would find uh, people who are in hotels or motels that are paid by charitable organizations or federal, state, and local government. So um, that category would be considered category one of the HUD homeless definition. Category two in, um, of the HUD definition, sometimes referred to um, in HUD documentation uh, and presentations as imminent risk. Uh, and in this category, category, category two, an individual or family who will imminently lose their primary nighttime residence, provided that it'll be lost within 14 days, um, that there's no subsequent, no subsequent residence has been identified, and the individual or family lacks the support networks needed to obtain permanent housing. Uh, this, as you can see, I put a little asterisk there. Um, primary nighttime residence there would include motels that aren't paid for by charity or government. In other words, if somebody's um, using their own income um, to pay for the motel, and also housing that is shared with others. So um, our, our um, motel families and um, those who are staying with others, uh, they would qualify under category two under these specific conditions. Looking now at category three of the HUD definition, um, sometimes referred to as homeless under other federal definitions, this is unaccompanied youth under 25 or families with children who do not otherwise qualify as homeless under the HUD definition but who, as you can see the conditions there, defined as homeless under other statutes, have not had um, lease ownership, etc., within 60 days, have experienced persistence instability as, um, I'm going to move my little slide here, as, as measured by two moves or more in the preceding 60 days, and can be expected to continue in such status for an extended period of time due to special needs or barriers. The person to qualify under category three has to meet all four of these conditions. So as you can see, it's very specific and very limited for category three. Category four of the HUD definition of homelessness is sometimes just referred to as the DV, DV, DV category, domestic violence, individual or family who is fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence and has no other residence and lacks the resources or support needed to obtain other permanent housing. So that's the, the, the four categories of the HUD homeless definition. So we're going to return back to these categories in just a moment, but I want to take a pause here. So now we, we know who is eligible for school protections and services under the education definition. We've reviewed that definition. We've reviewed the guidance and how to implement that and the context for that definition. We've also taken a look at the HUD definition and, and its four categories and conditions. But the question may be in many of your minds, well, what does being eligible for HUD homeless assistance mean? What if you were eligible and you were admitted? Uh, we'll get to that in a second, some other considerations. What, what are you actually qualified for? In essence, what does HUD homeless assistance provide? So what this next part of the presentation, what I want to do is take you through um, what HUD calls its program components that are available through HUD homeless assistance. And I realize this is very high level and that many of you can dig into the de details and know the weeds, but I, we wanted to keep things high level here um, so that everybody had the same uh, basic context. So the first program component to review that's available through HUD homeless assistance is permanent housing. This can be permanent supportive housing, um, the abbreviation you'll see throughout PSH. So this would be permanent housing with indefinite leasing or rental assistance that is paired with services to help people who have disabilities. Um, also considered under the permanent housing category of program component is rapid rehousing, which would emphasize housing search, relocation, and shorter medium-term rental assistance to move people as quickly as possible into permanent housing. And also services may be provided um, with rapid rehousing funds, um, the, the intensity and the amount of the services aren't really um, specified in the program, but that is, that is part, can, that may be part of rapid rehousing. 
The second program component, transitional housing. So um, this is um, housing that may, may cover the cost of up to 24 months with, some, with support. And for this, um, participants need to have a lease or occupancy agreement when residing in transitional housing. So that would be the second program component. The third one, supportive services only, which is pretty much exactly what it says. It's supportive services only. So this would be limited to um, recipients and subrecipients that are providing services to individuals or families who aren't residing in housing that's operated by the recipient. It is social services only. And there is um, an array of eligible services, outreach, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes this might look like case management services. In some cases, it might look like childcare. So um, that is um, the social services component of HUD homeless assistance. And then homelessness prevention. Um, and you can see here, and this is um, HUD homeless pre prevention, um, this could be shorter term, medium term rental assistance to either prevent somebody from becoming homeless, again, according to the HUD homeless definition. Um, and also this could be used for at risk of homeless. And again, re referencing back to those definitions, at risk of homeless would include um, our the education definition of homelessness. Also, I wanted to include here um, the program components and just say a bit about Emergency Solutions Grant because Emergency Solutions Grant is also um, referenced in ESSA as part of, it is part of HUD Homeless Assistance. So this is um, a different grant program. It is, it is not a competitive grant program. It's a formula program. Um, some the eligible recipients are usually um, cities, urban counties, states, um, very similar program components to HUD homeless assistance that we just reviewed. Um, one of the big difference besides the fact that this is a formula grant and not competitive is it's a much, much smaller funding level. So for fiscal year 2016, you know, we're looking at one point, almost 1.2 billion for HUD homeless assistance grants and only 270 million for ESG. So together they comprise the HUD homeless assistance that some families and youth who are eligible under the McKinney-Vento education definition uh, could also be eligible for and liaisons could affirm that status. Just now some general considerations. I know this is a lot of information and if you're coming from the school world, you know, we've been, you know, we have chocolate in the peanut butter and peanut butter in the chocolate. We're trying to figure out how to, how to make these, these two worlds come together to the, to the best possible, particularly with these new provisions. Um, this next slide also comes from the Department of Education's guidance. Very important to understand that being eligible under HUD's definition of homelessness does not necessarily mean that a family or youth is eligible for a specific HUD funded program. Um, one of those program components. And the reason for that is that HUD imposes additional criteria. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, one of the most uh, ones that we, we come we run into a lot is that even though we have a, you know, you have the HUD definition of homelessness, HUD limits the eligibility for rapid rehousing programs to people who are um, staying unsheltered, unsheltered locations on the streets or in emergency shelters. So yes, it's true that, you know, category two imminent risk, less than 14 days staying with somebody, you, you know, a family in that situation is, is eligible for HUD homeless assistance, but they wouldn't be eligible for rapid rehousing because HUD has imposed an additional restriction on that. So the, the takeaway here um, is that it's really important to know how programs are funded in your community and if there are additional eligibility criteria. Um, this is this is the lay of the land that is going to look very different in different communities. You know, are the programs HUD funded? Um, which program component are they funded are? And are there any additional eligibility criteria? I, we wanted to be very careful to include this information, not just because it's in the guidance, because um, depending on your community, um, this new piece of ESSA uh, may not, frankly, amount to much. Um, and But in your community, depending on what you have, it actually may provide a new opportunity. To understand um, HUD documentation's requ requirements, um, HUD's unlike the Department of Education, um, HUD's regulations require that each of the condition and subconditions in this definition be documented in some specific ways. So um, to know what those ways are, and I didn't want to go over them here, but rather provided a link for you. So you know you meet the definition, and then there has to be documentation that you meet the definition. 
Some additional considerations specifically on documentation. Um, this again is directly from the Department of Education's guidance. It's the responsibility of the HUD Homeless Recipient HUD, HUD Homeless Assistance Program, sorry, it's been a long week on a Friday here. Um, it's the responsibility of the recipient or subrecipient of funds under HUD Homeless Assistance, not the child or youth presenting, to determine whether a child or youth um, and his or her family are eligible for the project and also to obtain whatever documentation is necessary to maintain in the case file. So um, a very important piece to know, it's, it's, the, it's the program's responsibility. But here's where, you, where the liaisons come in. Local liaisons can provide affirmation um, of where the child or youth and his or her family have been residing. So local liaisons can be of great assistance to HUD homeless assistance uh, programs in uh, providing the affirmation uh, because they will, you, you will know. And again, according to the statute, um, no further uh, action needs to be necessary by HUD. Liaisons can provide that affirmation. Now, also straight from the guidance, if any criteria from HUD's homeless assistance cannot be documented by the third party like the liaison, um, the family or youth's own written certification that they meet the criteria is generally sufficient. Important that the word is generally there. Um, the important thing here is really knowing uh, who your providers are and having conversations with them so that you, liaisons can be of uh, best assistance in providing some of the documentation uh, for HUD homeless assistance. So I want to review now. I, I had mentioned earlier that um, you know there's eligibility uh, generally under the HUD definition and then knowing which programs program components are um, which pieces which categories of HUD's homeless definition um, how, how does that correspond with HUD's program components. So you have here for the continuum of care program components and little X's. So you can see that category one is essentially eligible for everything there. Category gun one again, and I think key point for school people is that if you're paying for motel, charitable, or government, you are part of category one. You're eligible for all of the above. Um, imminent risk you can see more limited other federal statutes also more limited specifically because as you can see at the bottom in order for continuums of care to even serve anyone under uh, category three they have to have prior approval from HUD so uh, in the interest of um, just directness and I guess bluntness category three really doesn't account for much or mean much um, under this um, current paradigm here under the current rules. And then you can see um, category for domestic violence, the programs, program components for which um, they are eligible. And just a quick review so you know for ESG, the same thing, um, which categories of HUD homeless are eligible for which ESG program component. I'm not going to go over this in great detail, but because again, the funding is so, so limited here, but I wanted to provide it for you. So um, both for um, your general understanding and so you know sort of who to talk to in your community. So just stepping back a little bit to think about what does this actually mean um, for you and your community, I think the you know, again, just to reiterate that liaisons may be able to assist additional families and youth and also be of assistance to HUD homeless assistance providers because of liaisons' unique knowledge of families and youth who are experiencing homelessness. Liaisons will know uh, which family is paying for a motel and, um, you know, they, they don't have, they have less than 14 days. You will know uh, if, for example, um, uh, a charitable organization is paying for a family's motel and so they meet category one. Uh, liaisons will have information about children and youth um, that may not be known and to the HUD homeless assistance providers and it may be much easier for all parties to just be able to provide that simple affirmation. The other possible benefit of this new policy is that we may see improved collaborations between, between school districts and HUD continuums of care, especially if processes are put in place to streamline referrals and if providers, HUD providers and educators receive cross-training. So again, just to say this is going to look different in different communities, but it's an opportunity to have a conversation, see what this ultimately means, and to do some cross-training so that both sides are familiar with both definitions uh, you know HUD homeless assistance providers they may know for example which family or youth exits one of their programs 
and doesn't go into permanent housing, but rather goes into a doubled up situation that would qualify them for McKinney Vento education protections, or goes into another living situation that HUD doesn't consider homeless, but schools do. So HUD providers also, it's important for them to know the education definition in order to ensure that all eligible children and youth for McKinney Mental Services have the benefits of school access, school stability, and the support that's provided through school systems. So those are some of the possible benefits. Um, I wanted to you know, really focus in on where uh, we see some of the biggest potential again, as I mentioned, and just to sort of restate it, maybe here for the third time, is that under HUD's definition, families or youth whose motel room is paid for by government or charity do meet category one. This means that they are eligible for rapid rehousing and they might be eligible for permanent supportive housing if they have an individual family member who has a disability. So that I think is the category of overlap between the HUD definition and the education definition where this new authority um, could potentially have some meaning. Um, the other situation where we may see some um, the real, you know, benefits here is that families or youth who are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence and have nowhere else to go meet category four and they are eligible for permanent supportive housing if they have an individual family member with a disability. This is another overlap in definitions where uh, schools may have more information about a youth or about a family and may be able to provide that to the HUD provider to help them gain access to a program that they really need. So just, you know, sort of cluing you in and in this, all these categories, all these sub conditions, all these documentation requirements, wanted to sort of drill it down to some of the most basic points about this new policy. And again, some of the limitations. Uh, we don't, do not want to in any way, shape or form overstate what this means or oversell it. Um, ESSA does not change HUD's definition of homelessness. So HUD's definition of homelessness continues to exclude most children and youth who are homeless in this nation who are identified by public schools. Um, what this means is that families who pay to stay in motels um, with whatever source of income, and sometimes those sources of income are not stable, and sometimes they're not healthy, um, those who are paying to stay in motels or are staying with some others temporarily, they're, they're most likely, the overlap is most likely for category two. Um, less than 14 days, have nowhere else to go. This would be a potential uh, area if we had our little interlapping circles of overlap. However, category two has um, limited relevance because, um, again, because again of the additional restrictions that HUD applies to the programs. So category two at imminent risk um, are eligible for supportive services only in transitional housing, but those are two programs that HUD has been systematically defunding. So mostly HUD is emphasizing funding for rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing, but only people who are in categories one and four are eligible for those programs. So um, the, the reality is there's not much in the way of HUD homeless assistance that available for uh, people who are staying in motels or staying with others. And the prevention assistance under ESG is extremely limited. Um, and sometimes it's just not what people need. You know, people who are in staying with others and, and situations not, not good for kids, other situations, um, or in motels where they're paying for it, they may really need rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing. But currently, under the current lay of the land, under the current statute, um, they're not eligible for it. So uh, is this making your head hurt? We don't want to disrupt your Friday. But if this is very confusing and seems very complex, it is. Um, and we are advocating for a more sensible policy in the future. Um, we, there's legislation that's been introduced in the last Congress called the Homeless Children and Youth Act. Uh, we do expect it to be introduced in the next session of Congress as well. This is bipartisan legislation that would greatly simplify things. Um, it would amend HUD's definition of homelessness to include children and youth who are verified as homeless by school liaisons, RHOA providers, HUD providers, et cetera. So rather than having to go through this, this complicated dance, um, if you were eligible under the education definition, you would be eligible under the HUD, HUD homeless assistant for HUD homeless assistance programs. So um, that would be streamlined in the same way that liaisons are authorized to um, 
determine that a youth is unaccompanied and homeless for, for financial aid or for school meals, a very similar streamlined process would be in place for HUD homeless assistance. Um, the other thing this legislation would do would really return to a true community needs assessment guiding how communities are able to use their local funds. So rather than being um, you know, essentially forced to prioritize chronically homeless adults or forced to prioritize a certain program model like rapid rehousing, it would return that discretion to the community so that the needs assessment that they do based on their own populations um, would be ones that would be honored by HUD as long as they were uh, cost effective. So again, more information about that HUD the, on the, the Help Homeless Kids Now website. Um, and stay tuned to that. We know there's lots of things happening in November that would sh change the shape of Congress. Um, so just to, to po point that out there that if you're scratching your head um, and wondering if there's a better way, we think that there is. Uh, and with that, uh, actually um, what I want to do, I think I'll take a pause here. I, we do have, no, actually what I do, I, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I have just a couple more slides on, on resources. Um, so I know sometimes people have to leave early and it may be lunch hour for you on the East Coast. So I'll go ahead and finish up these last couple slides and then stop and see if we can answer some questions for you through the chat box. Uh, we do have a lot more on ESSA that is available. Um, this PowerPoint, you should have it in the materials um, tab of your of your GoTo training control panel. Um, it's all also on our website, so you have this PowerPoint if you want to edit it and use it in your trainings. But there's a lot more there, frequently asked questions, um, pop quizzes, considerations, all of that there. So for those of you who are coming from the school world, wanted to make sure you were aware of that one-stop shop through NACI. Um, also, some additional NACI resources that may be helpful for you. We do have a housing page on our website, which uh, reviews some of the requirements for HUD homeless assistance um, to coordinate with school districts and to let families and youth know about their eligibility for education and early care. There's a sample local policy there, definitions comparison. Also have a great resource um, on housing and unaccompanied youth and what schools and communities are doing there. So I wanted to just kind of signal that for you. We have a housing resources page. We also have an early childhood page um, that we would encourage you to look at as you're working with your HUD homeless assistance partners, knowing that um, of the children living in HUD homeless assistance, over half are under the age of six. So the early childhood connections are an important part of the conversation to have with your HUD homeless assistance providers. And we have brand new far-reaching rules on Head Start and child care that just came out uh, in this last month that really improve access to early childhood programs. So it's so important for not just liaisons but also for HUD homeless providers to be aware of those new rules so we can make sure that our youngest children are getting the support that they need to start out on, on the right trajectory in life and be ready for school and limit the damage that happens as a result of homelessness. So I want to make a plug there for, our, for that. And lastly, I um, really want to make a plug for our NACI conference. Um, even if you can't go, obviously it's just in a couple weeks, so you may not have the budget, you may not get approved, but we do provide um, excellent training and we have it this year a very, very robust housing partnership track. We're very excited about the partnerships with schools and um, housing providers, both for families and for youth. So we were very intentional this year about building up that track and we do, we will provide um, the PowerPoints um, from all this and the materials on our website um, later in November. So even if you can't come to the NACI conference, you know, please check out what's being offered. You can read the concurrent sessions and you can also check out later in November or December to that content so you can see exactly where we have some of the bright spots for improving the coordination. So with that, um, I've talked now for 45 minutes straight. Patricia made me do this one all by myself. Um, so we're going to take a break here, or not a break, but rather take a pause and see if I am able to answer any questions. And also we have a couple other experts on the call um, that I may call on um, who may wish to, to weigh in as well. So Patricia, if you would help us out now, that'd be great. Sure, Barbara. One question that has come in a couple of times is about the definition that HUD uses of the term disability. So if a person is trying to access supportive housing, um, what does it mean to have a disability and how that overlaps with disabilities under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act? Um, and I can just start off the conversation by saying that once again the definitions are different. 
Um, and so you cannot assume that just because uh, someone might have a disability, a student, for example, for the purposes of IDEA, for special education in school, that does not necessarily mean that they're going to meet the definition of disability under HUD. Um, but I am very far from an expert on how HUD defines disability and whether um, if a child is living with their parents, if the child has a disability, would that qualify them or is it the parent who has to have a disability? So I'm not sure, Barbara, if you can speak a little to that or perhaps one of our other experts on the phone can. I'll start and then I'm happy um, to, um, to, uh, to see if um, either Christina or Margaret um, wants to jump in. But what I've done is I've sort of gone back in the PowerPoint to HUD's documentation requirements. This would be the link um, that would, I think, I'm, I'm showing it, I'm sure there's other links as well, but given that um, not only is there a dis definition of disability, but there's also documentation for it. I'm just sort of flipping quickly to that one. Um, what I will say is that we are um, talking about uh, in, we are talking about adults. Um, a child with a disability um, that would not make a family eligible, for example, for permanent supportive housing. Um, this is um, so. In other words, you know, they, they, it would need to be an individual adult member of the family, not a child. Um, and I'm happy to I'm happy to turn it over. I don't know if, if Margaret or Christina would like to jump in or um, flag your flag your hand if you are a person on the on the call who can give a short, succinct answer and help folks out with this particular piece. Barbara, this is Christina at NCAT. I, I think you're on the right track. The, the only thing that I would say is usually when I read HUD documentation about disabilities, it oftentimes, you know, it is referring to the adult and it talks a lot about maybe like a severe mental health condition or even like a, a chemical dependency. So I, my guess is it's a, a smaller subset and it would not extend to, you know, some of the disabilities identified under IDEA, like developmental disabilities of children and things like that. But again, I'm kind of with Trisha. That's just my instinct, but I don't, know that I can point to like black and white. Maybe Margaret or Jim Yu or someone has additional thoughts. And I did actually just post in the chat box, if you take a look, there is a link to the regulations that outlines HUD's definition of developmental disability and also HUD's definition of disability. Um, and we don't need to get into the weeds on it, but anyone who is familiar with uh, the definition of disability under IDEA um, we'll be able to take a look at that and pretty quickly see some of the differences. Um, and it's pretty clear that they do, while they're probably, you know, a Venn diagram where they overlap a little bit in the middle, they certainly are, are very different. Okay, thank you, Christina and Patricia. Barbara, I was able to answer a few other questions already in the chat box. Maybe just one other, which is a little bit of a brainstorming question, perhaps, is someone was uh, asking about a family they've been working with who lost their house due to a fire um, and wondering what help might be available for that family. I don't know if there would even be help available through HUD or if anyone has any other ideas for how uh, this person might be able to help the family who's been homeless for over a month now um, due to a fire in their home. Well, I think, you know, with the, 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 there are lots of follow-up questions that would need to be asked, including sort of where are they staying now, um, and does the place where they're staying now fit um, any of these definitions that we've been talking about? So that would be the response in terms of kind of figuring out for the HUD homeless assistance programs, um, but there, you know, in communities there may, there may be other uh, resources that are available. I think, and you know, it's important to know that HUD homeless assistance is, is a tiny amount of money that goes out in the scheme of um, homeless assistance services and emergency services in communities. There's, you know, there's private money, there's United Way, there's lots of other uh, community resources out there. Not, there may not be lots of it, but there are other, I would say, let me qualify that, there are other sources of assistance that are not HUD funded. So um, there may be relief agencies, um, other places like that, but I think in terms of the relevance of that question to this particular topic of, for today's training, we would need to look at, you know, not just w the fire situation, but also where they're actually staying right now and whether it would meet um, any of these criteria.
Thanks, Barbara. I think the only question that's probably still outstanding is um, the ability to use education funds, particularly in the Kinney Vento education funds, or maybe even Title I funds to pay for housing or hotels or motels. And I think uh, I've already typed that into the chat box, and the answer is no, we cannot use education funds to pay for housing or shelters. Yes, and um, that, that obviously is correct, but um, again, I do want to say that um, we are seeing some really unique partnerships between school districts and housing agencies, and there are, for example, some um, school district liaisons have been able to work with faith-based organizations and have a reserve uh, for families in crises. Uh, so that way they have, if they have, they have somebody who has absolutely nowhere else to go, they have a relationship with a motel, they have these funds, they're not federal funds, but they are donated funds, uh, and often it's faith-based, but sometimes, for example, there are banks um, in the South, I won't name them, but that are giving significantly to homeless liaison McKinney-Vento programs, and some of those programs are using, setting aside funds from that grant from the bank um, to have emergency resources to put families up temporarily uh, until they can find somewhere else to go. So while McKinney-Vento funds for education purposes are not, that's not an eligible use of funds, um, there may be other ways to kind of to have that sort of backup emergency because schools are going to know. I mean, that it's the school, you know, liaison or counselor who's going to hear first before a family would even think to uh, check to what's available. So it's really good to kind of know exactly what's available and who you might partner with in your community to create additional assistance. Um, and I'm going to ask Christina uh, Dukes again, is there anything else um, based, Christina is our federal liaison for the National Center for Homeless Education and she works very closely with HUD, works very closely in the interagency conversations. Um, and so I just want to see, Christina, is there anything else kind of tips or considerations that you'd like to offer based on your experience? I mean, I really think you did an excellent job of covering everything, Barbara. I think the key point that I really agree with is that I, I think um, to really make this new authority actually have sort of an effect in the field, it really is going to depend on uh, the willingness of local communities, both school districts and COCs, to work together to leverage this to the fullest extent. So it's early days. I think we kind of have to wait and see. Uh, it, it has some potential, which I think Barbara did a really wonderful job of, of outlining it, but it is going to take some, some local people to dig into it and, and make it work. So um, I, agree. I think you did a good job. That's, that's about all I would have to add. All right. Thanks. So if there's not any questions, I just want to sort of end with the final, final slide. Here we go. Um, general resources. So here you have, we put the HUD exchange, HUD homeless assistance. This is your one-stop shop for um, for all of this. And if there are, for example, if you want, they, they've got two pagers that go over some of the eligibility pieces here. If you want something directly from the source, it's there. You have our website, um, uh, Christina's website, National Center on Homeless Education. And we also wanted to be sure to list our partners. Um, on youth issues, on accompanied homeless youth issues, the National Network for Youth. They do great webinars, for example, on coordinated assessment in youth. Um, they are really at the forefront of the intersection of youth-specific issues and HUD homeless assistance. So um, would refer you to look at their website and resources as well. This is Margaret and Jimmy. Can you hear us now? Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you. Wow, uh, yes, we've been trying to chime in for a little while here, but we were having some technical difficulties. I guess two, two points that I wanted to make, and then Margaret may chime in as well. Um, one specific to uh, some of the questions around uh, permanent supportive housing and uh, the disability. Just one thing to be mindful of is that those families still have to meet the definition for chronic homeless, which include um, having that length of stay of, of uh, either 12 months or multiple episodes of homelessness within a three-year period that are also accumulating a 12-month period. So there's some tricky things in the, the the new definition of how we are supposed to capture chronic homelessness that uh, has been very prohibitive for our, our families to get uh, attached to services. Um, and then I think the second point we wanted to make was uh, specific to the coordinated entry process and how that is uh, somewhat exclusive of, of uh, some of the families that we're seeing that are presenting mainly because once the individuals get through that process for coordinated entry, uh, there's a level of prioritization that's going to happen to determine who 
is uh, at need, who, at, who presents with the, with the most needs at that particular moment. So many of the families that we may be seeing um, coming through the schools, uh, a definition of homelessness may not rise to the top of that list and, and potentially may never get served. On the flip side of that, the access of, of the, the services through the coordinated entry process should help um, communities and, and school service providers to have a better understanding of who can provide the service for the family, but there still may be some, some slowing period within the prioritization of those families that are accessing the system. Anything Thank you. That, thank you so much. Margaret, is there anything else you want to add? Um, two other things. One thing I wanted to mention in terms of HUD funding priorities, you did obviously address the fact that um, transitional housing for the most part is being eliminated as is supportive services only. The issue, and with leaving permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing is the primary funding um, priorities. I will mention too that it's important to note that with open opening doors, the federal strategic plan that families with children are an increased priority. So not only rapid rehousing in general, but rapid rehousing for families with children is a, is a priority and will continue to be. So um, as an example, last year's NOFA only allowed us as rapid rehousing providers to use those dollars for families with children. This most recent NOFA did allow us to include individuals in there. But I would say the good news is that there has been more money, specifically rapid rehousing, for families with children. Not so much permanent supportive housing, as Jimmy, you explained, it's very, it would be very difficult for them to meet that definition. But hopefully this next, what you're seeing, the money's hitting the street now, and then in the next year or two, under rapid rehousing will really help families with children. So those are the good things. And uh, the, I guess the other point that I was gonna say is we will be in Orlando. So if anybody Great. has any questions, come find us. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that you are both on the call. Um, our partners at PCCI in Georgia who have been um, just wonderful partners in trying to, again, the peanut butter and the chocolate and the chocolate and the peanut butter and how do we make sure that schools and HUD homeless assistance agencies are um, working together and understanding the limits and, um, and, and advocating to change some of these limits. And um, so um, really want to be very, um, very grateful for your continued partnership and your participation uh, on this webinar. Um, and with that, I think we are close to one o'clock here. So Patricia, we did record this, did we? Yes, we did. So it'll take oh, a few good. days to get it uh, up on the website, but we can do that. Thank you. I say I say we meaning did Patricia hit remember to hit the record button because I did not. So in any case, thank you very much for joining us all and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful weekend.